I feel like that was a moment where people were really hungry to have these difficult conversations and ready to kind of look at things that had been taken for granted as as normal and to say, hey, actually, that's not normal at all. And we have this shared experience, like literally me too. From Mama Mia, I'm Mia Friedman, and you're listening to No Filter, candid conversations that count. The first time someone sent me a link to the viral short story cat person and told me I absolutely must read it, I was pretty annoyed. I don't like cats and I don't like short stories and I didn't have time to read fiction because, you know, the news cycle's always popping and fizzing with so much more urgency than someone's dumb story about their cat. But then I got sent the link a second time and a third and a fourth and a fifth and I reckon in the space of maybe a day or two, I got sent that link probably a dozen times. And all of these links came with texts with, oh my God, emojis, and you must read this. And so eventually I decided, okay, well, there's obviously something here because so many different women have sent it to me. I better read it. So I grudgingly clicked on the story and 20 or so minutes later after I'd finished it, I immediately sent the link to about 10 other friends and told them that they absolutely had to read this story. That was back in 2017 and you might have had the same experience back then. Someone probably sent you a link or you might have seen it on Facebook. You might have heard people talking about Cat Person on a podcast. I know we certainly talked about it on Mamma Mia Out Loud. It was like nothing I have ever seen before. There were millions of people reading this one same piece of fiction over the space of just a few days and it was sparking debates and conversations and arguments and opinion pieces and backlashes and it was trending on Twitter and it just seemed to go on and on. So what the hell was this story about? Well, not much really is the surprising answer and also in a way everything. It was just a story so right for the time. Now, if you didn't read it and you're wondering what on earth I'm talking about, let me explain what Cat Person is about. It's a story that's told from the point of view of Margot. She's a 20-year-old college student And she gradually sort of falls into this flirtation with a guy named Robert. Robert's 34 and he is the cat person in the story. He owns a couple of cats, even though you never actually meet them during the story. And Robert and Margot meet at the movie theatre where she works part-time. And it's a very relatable modern dating story. They exchange a frenzy of texts over the next few weeks after they meet and she imagines all sorts of positive things about Robert that turn out not to be true, which is something I think that a lot of women often do in those early stages. They eventually go on a date, which goes pretty badly. The chemistry of their flirtation kind of fizzles in person, as is sometimes the case. But she still decides to sleep with him, and it's something she regrets even before she's done it. It's not a story about consent or me too. It's not about sexual assault. Robert doesn't do anything particularly wrong, even though some people tried to frame it that way. But what it did is explore the really often subtle dynamics of power and dating and how sometimes a woman has sex with a man because she thought maybe she wanted to and now she doesn't, but it somehow seems easier to just go through with it than to get out of a really awkward situation. The woman behind this viral literary sensation was a writer called Kristen Rupenian. And just try to imagine for a moment what it felt like to be her at the centre of such a massive global phenomenon. Two years later, she's still trying to process what it was like to literally become world famous within the space of a few hours and to have so many people make assumptions about her and her lifestyle that were almost hilariously far from the truth of what her life actually was like. Kristen has just released her first book. It's called You Know You Want This and it has been described a bit like Black Mirror meets Sex in the City. I had lots of questions for Kristen, and while she was in Australia to launch her book, she came into Mamma Mia for a chat. So tell me about the phone call when the New Yorker rang and said they'd accepted Cat Person for publication. I was in a noodles and company, a fast food restaurant in Ann Arbor, and I looked at my phone and I had a missed call from a 212 area code, a New York area code, and 
I didn't have it in my phone because at that point I'd only talked to my agent like once. So I didn't even have her <laughs> number on my phone. But because I'd been through when I when my novel went out and it didn't sell, I had spent several weeks sort of just dying for a 212 number to show up on my phone because I knew that that's how I would find out if the novel had sold. And so when I looked at the phone and saw the 212 number, I did think my story got into New Yorker, which was, was bold because like I didn't have evidence, but I just felt it. I was like, oh, I bet that's what it is. And people don't really ring to deliver bad news. No, they don't. That yeah. is a publishing thing, and I guess true in, in life as yeah. well. And so I had a message from from Jenny saying, call me, and, and I called her, and, and she told me. And she truly was as shocked as I was. I don't know. She, <laughs> she was just, we were both very, very taken aback. But I mean, I was, I was so happy. Who was the first person you told? Um, I went and sat in the quad of... of I was down by campus, so I called. I think I called my mom, but she didn't pick up, and so I reached my dad in an airport somewhere, and he was like, I'm so proud. I don't really understand, yeah. but I'm very proud. <laughs> the significance. It sounds yeah. like a really big you deal. You seem very happy. <laughs> it must have been a weird thing, and I it happened in waves, didn't it? So yeah. the day it was published, mm -hmm. tell me how the next few weeks unfolded and how it slowly dawned on you that it wasn't just going to be oh, my God, I've been published in The New Yorker, but it was going to become this zeitgeist phenomenon that no one could have predicted. Yeah. So, yeah, the story came out in December. So I, I recorded the story. Uh, I was in New York, and then I went back to Michigan where I lived. And the story came out, I think, on a Monday, and it went up online and appeared in print at the same time. And so that day I sort of woke up like it was Christmas. I was like, oh, where's my story? And I tried to go find a copy and I couldn't. Like, it just hadn't arrived yet in Michigan. So I was like, all right, that's fine. I'll wait. And But the story was online. So I, so I, I put it on Facebook because I'm old. And the um, everyone I knew liked it and said congratulations. And it felt very exciting. And then I went out to drinks with, with my friends. But there was a moment where I was like, oh, okay, that's it. Like, that's what it feels like when all your dreams come true. Like, it happens. And Done. Then, yeah, exactly. And then ne the next day you go back um, and you sort of keep living your life. And so so the story, yeah, came out on a Monday. And then, like, two, the most of that week passed without much news. My Jenny and I had decided, even when you get a story in The New Yorker, which is sort of the the biggest thing you can aim for as a short story writer, I think we thought that increases our chances of selling the book, but certainly doesn't guarantee it. So we were like, I had finished like editing it and put together the. So manuscript. this is you know you want yes. this. You had this book of short stories, yeah. of which Cat Person was one. Exactly. So we had the yeah the book manuscript, and we thought we'll go out with it after the holidays because it was coming up on Christmas. And so I was like tinkering with that and thinking about it. And I think maybe one or two people had sent, having read the story, had sent Jenny an email being like, you know, what's up? Let's have a conversation. So that was good, but it was like little bubbles of of possibility. And then it was Friday. I was at a coffee shop with my girlfriend, and she's a writer too, so we were both uh, working. And then she got on Twitter, which I had Twitter, but I didn't. I hadn't like even posted the story. Like As a I wasn't fiction writer. You yeah. don't really think, wow, it's going to be trending on exactly. Twitter. <laughs> no, no, and like there, but there is like sort of a literary Twitter that I True. was not fully like I didn't really understand, but she did more. She worked in publishing. She had a, more of a, a finger on the pulse, and so I mean I vividly remember it's a story I'll tell for the rest of my life but we were sitting there and she looks up from her computer and she's like something's going on with your story and I was like what and she's oh Twitter and we had this weird little conversation where she sort of tried to explain that people were talking about my story on Twitter and I just kind of stubbornly refused to understand that it meant anything we got into like a little bit of a squabble where I was like oh I don't know blah, blah, blah. and she's like I don't know. She, I just didn't get it. Was she worried for you and were you scared or I were think, you just... I think there was a little bit of fear maybe in the back of my mind. I don't know that she... I think she was kind of stunned. I think she, earlier than I did, recognized that it was weird, that it was like sort of moving out of the nor the sphere where people are normally talking about short stories and becoming this other thing. But so it I jumped from literary Twitter to... Everything. Yeah. Twitter. And I don't know that it even really had been on literary Twitter prior. You know, maybe a couple of people had liked it or whatever. But but yeah, that there was this other thing that was happening. And I think um, literary Twitter maybe noticed that something was going on and was the one that maybe told her. I don't know. I have to like ask her what exactly it was she she saw. But anyway, so I um, we had that conversation and then I went home and I got on Twitter and I tried to figure it out. And I had notifications, but I think it wasn't actually... I could, it was still hard for me to figure out. Even being on Twitter, I was like, okay, people are reading it. They're talking about it. But they're also sort of – and this is 
consistently what I find happens when I try and understand Twitter is like everyone was talking about it as though they were looking at something that I couldn't see. You know, like, oh, everyone's talking about cat person. But like, where were the people who are actually talking about cat person? I don't know. And so I so I, I was in and I was sort of, of searching and I, I've told this story before, but I was I was looking for I was trying to read it. And then my mom called and I, I was like, mom, something's going on with my story. I don't know. It's on Twitter. I'm confused. And she got on Twitter and she started searching and we both were kind of baffled. And then at one point she said, Kristen, oh, my God, someone Barack Obama follows on Twitter, shared your story. Do you think Barack Obama read your story? And then she started crying. <laughs> and that was like the moment where I was like, OK, something really weird is going on. On your list of, yeah. of, of um, external objective markers for success, yes. Barack Obama reading your short story about really bad sex uh-huh. is probably just out of the realm of. Right. And I mean, to be fair, imagining. we still have no evidence whether Barack Obama read my story or not. But imagining Barack and Michelle sitting side by side, yeah. like in bed, being like, what do you think about the story, Michelle? I don't know. But it became one of yeah. those things. Uh, I received a few links to it. Yeah. And I was like, oh, I don't like short stories. I don't want to read yeah. it. And then another one. And then yeah. another link. And then and I thought, OK, well, I've to be part of the conversation, right. I have to. I had not even FOMO. It was almost resentful that yeah. there's something going on that I feel really left out of. Mm-hmm. So I read it and I went, Oh my God. I mean, I sent it to 20 people who probably felt the same way when they got it. But then this next wave of people debating it. Right. How did you become aware of that and what did that feel like? Yeah. I mean, that's the. So my mom and I were on Twitter and then I was reading Twitter for a while and then I thought, this is too much. I have to get off. And so I closed my computer. Well, I sent a message to Jenny. I was like, what's going on? I don't know. We should figure this out. And Did then, the New Yorker co- contact her or contact you? No. Or? I mean, by the... Because so, they would have looked at their metrics and gone, yeah. holy shit. And it was happening over a weekend, which I think is part of it. So everyone was kind of scrambling to catch up. So so in my, now, honestly, my memory of those two days, my brain kind of shuts off after that conversation with my mom. I can't remember <laughs> things very clearly. Then I started getting emails from people who were like, like, I see your story, da, da, da. everyone was talking about it. Or, like, I did have – it wasn't easy to find me. I didn't have my, like, direct messages open on Twitter. And my email address you could find if you sort of went several pages into, like, an old website. But that – people did start to find it. So then I was getting directly contacted and then – By industry people or by no, readers? Uh, mostly – first by readers. There was a kind of – kind of, a few waves. So by the, that first day or two, it was a lot of readers and then people that I knew saying, oh, I'm seeing that people are talking about your story. Do you know this is happening? And over that weekend, it was mostly readers. And then on the Monday, or it was a, a Sunday night, I remember a New York Times guy got a hold of me kind of early and was like, your story trended. We want to talk to you. And I was, didn't know what I should do. But I talked to Jenny and she was like, yeah, just talk to him, but then don't talk to anybody else, which turned out to be really good advice because on that Monday, then it was like something had happened on Twitter. And on Monday, everyone who wasn't super on Twitter was like, we should talk about this thing that happened on Twitter. Yeah. And so that was then all, all I started getting all these media requests and other kinds of like, come and talk about sex on the radio and, you know, where. And so that all I said no to, which I'm really glad that I did. Did you have someone in between you and this wave? Um, Jenny was sort of, you know, tried to, but so when that happened, then, then publishers also were interested. And so then they were coming to us. And so that week kind of luckily my attention shifted to, we're going to sell the book. I have to talk to editors and stuff about that. And so I was paying more attention to that and letting everything else kind of go under the bridge. And then once the book sold and we were talking to publishers, then they were like, yeah, you don't have to do any interviews because until you have a book to sell, like you don't really necessarily, you're just giving, you're sort of having these conversations people will be sick of you. (laughs) You know, why don't you just hold back and then you'll be able to talk about it later and with some space. And so I'm really glad. Like now. Exactly. (laughs) Which is much, much easier a year and a half with that level of of distance. I think I'm really... Really, I can imagine a version of this whole thing playing out where I was on Twitter and trying to like talk back to everybody who was talking to me and like feeling an obligation to try and like manage this thing that had happened that was like spinning out beyond my control. Mm. And sometimes when I imagine sort of the writer who kind of was Margot, do you know what I mean? Who was much younger, who was writing a story about something that happened to her last week and imagining being faced with that level of attention and criticism and kind of, yeah, like uh, being kind of the focus, it just 
just seems like how could I have let like that would be awful Mm -hmm. you know if I I don't know I think if I had been you know 10 or even five years younger it would have been much much harder to say yeah no thank you I'm not going to have this conversation right now it's kind of like the inverse of a pylon it's like during a pylon everyone's piling onto someone and that person is being screamed at to Mm -hmm. apologize you were being sort of screamed at for insight and speak about me too and speak about sex and speak about young women. Right. And I think what I was really aware of now that's easy to forget because of where the conversation went, which I think was essentially positive, right? Like that there were kind of like uglier streaks and like people who had various opinions, but I feel like largely the conversation went in a good direction, right? And that people managed to have a kind of surprisingly nuanced conversation about difficult topics sort of by using the story as a proxy. And I think, but what often happens is that if I had been there and I had been trying in this kind of like sleepless crazed mode to like talk about things, I would have eventually said something terrible and stupid. And there would have been that much more familiar arc, I think, where someone's raised up really high, like given all this attention and then inevitably kind of fucks it up. And then it's like the, mm. you're on the downward side. And I feel like that is, I don't feel like it's a super, that that to be in the public gaze in that way, kind of when you're not prepared for it, when you don't have distance over something and we're trying to talk about complicated you're set up to fail then and I think if I had tried to to be a part of that conversation probably the conversation would have gone actually much more poorly and my absence actually let other people kind of step in and like have you know each everybody had a little different piece of the conversation instead of it being focused on me and what I thought and what I was like trying to say what other people think of me is none of my business is exactly. something that people must have said or you must have said to yourself a yeah, lot of exactly. times as you watched your characters being dissected yeah. and you being dissected. And I remember at one point people were accusing you of fat shaming because one of your character, yeah. because your main character had a thought. Right. And it was like that level of policing of, of what fiction was. That must have been quite surreal. It was. I mean, I think that that's exactly, that is a quote that means a lot to me. <laughs> the what other people think of me is none of my business in the sense that like, I think, and again, the time I spent in the graduate program thinking about myself more as a critic than as a writer has been useful to me in the sense that I feel like people absolutely have the right to tear any kind of story apart, you know, and to give, to react in whatever kind of visceral way that they feel and then to like talk and argue about why they think it's good or not. I, I, in the abstract, I believe that absolutely. And I think what I learned is that I am also a human. And so I need to step back, like you give your story and then you, it's, your job is probably mostly just to stay the hell out of it because, of course, when people are saying, like, interpreting your story and saying, you know... You shouldn't have said that and you shouldn't have written that. And it's like, it's fiction. It's not an opinion piece. Yeah, and also that there's a direct one-to-one correlation between the kind of story you wrote and the kind of person that you are. That is really hard hard to tune out. And I think that line became very slippery. Who Margot was, whether she was a good or bad person, who I was, what I was trying to say, Mm. whether it was good or bad. And I think, again, like... People have the right to do that, but I have to have the right and sort of the – it's my responsibility to just sort of step back and be like, people can criticize my story. And also, like, there are probably things in my story that I don't recognize, you know, especially right away. Like, if I – there are almost certainly aspects of that story that kind of need – I need other people to help me figure out Joints and to understand. And yeah. And, and that, people will join dots in different ways. Exactly. Right? Exactly. And, like, especially in the moment, it seems like – I will have really strong opinions about my story. And then a year later, I'm like, you know what? They're probably right. Maybe like this piece, you know, wasn't working as well. Or there was this, you know, ardent occurrence of something. And I can see that with distance. But in the moment, I'm not going to be able to respond mm-hmm. to that kind of conversation in any, like, thoughtful way. I'm just going to be like, ah, ah, ah. <laughs> I'm a good person, I swear. <laughs> you know? You wrote the story a few months before the Me Too movement yeah. sort of picked up steam yeah. and Harvey Weinstein and everything. Yeah. So the table was laid in a way, particularly after the issue around Aziz Ansari mm-hmm. and the, the babe.net story by that, that woman who'd right. slept with him and had a, an experience that she didn't say was sexual assault, but it was just some people said that it was inappropriate behaviour. Other people said it was just bad sex and a bad date. So it mm-hmm. was kind of in that grey zone. Mm-hmm. Harvey Weinstein is in the red zone or the the black zone. This yeah. is in the grey zone. And, and it, at its heart is – a sexual experience between a young woman and an older man where I don't want to put words into yeah. your mouth, but how would you describe it? 
I think there are really strong connections between the Me Too movement and the conversation that people had around my story in the sense that... In a helpful way or not a helpful in way? A, I mean, I guess I, in the sense that like, I feel like that was a moment where people were really hungry to have these difficult conversations and ready to kind of look at things that had been taken for granted as, as normal and to say, hey, actually, that's not normal at all. And we have this shared experience, like literally me too. Like literally this thing that I thought was only mine yes. is shared. Um, and I think that is a that did really help shape the conversation around my story. But I do think it is also important to say exactly what you did, which is that I do sometimes feel a little uncomfortable when my when Capriton is held up as like the face of Me Too, because it is the least of all of the stories that were coming out in comparison to mine. Like that was not a question of murky gray. Right? Like he, that, that was like predators preying on people, yeah, right? Yeah. And so to swap in a story that isn't exactly like that does. This was just about power dynamics, yeah, wasn't it? And, yeah. and kind of dating and the things women do to make men feel comfortable right which is all a big part of like the messy cultural space we're in right now but like yeah. i don't know it just it is good i think to pause and recognize we're talking about really different experiences under the same umbrella another surreal part in this story was when there was a cover story in the Sunday Times in the UK oh God, that saying that, that paper. <laughs> you were dating a woman. Uh-huh. That must have been weird. <laughs> yeah, it was. I was so my girlfriend and Callie, um, we're still together. We When you came in, I was gonna yeah. say, Is Callie with you? And then I thought that would feel so weird to you. It's like I'm a fiction writer. How do you know my girlfriend's know. name? This is weird. But at this point, it's like <laughs> this is our new reality. She is in, in Sydney with me, which is great, but she's you know, back at the hotel relaxing. So <laughs> um but yeah, no, so we have been dating for I mean, not long at all. She was in my in my writing program, so I known her for a while but we've probably been dating like two or three months seriously when the story came out was and it the first time you dated a woman it was it was and it was like we were open about it I mean it wasn't it wasn't a secret but you know my dad didn't know my dad lives in Alaska and so there was this bizarre calculus that was happening where I was like getting thrust into the spotlight in this moment where there were a lot of people who were the major things going on in my life that other people didn't know that suddenly it was like, are they going to find out oh, from the New York Times? Like, what the hell? And so, I mean, that was that was another thing where it's just like, this is so different than how it looks on the outside with all the things you're probably wondering what I'm thinking or feeling. You know, if you're just reading about this on Twitter, like my life is actually very different. But I mean, I was in the end, it was just like so lucky I'm just was very lucky to have her and still am. You know what I mean? It was to have someone to go through that with was amazing. I dealt with it. Like, I mean, I dealt with the publicity stuff. Like, it was another piece of just like, not everyone has to know everything that's going on with me it's right kind now. Kind of being out. Did you see it as being outed? I mean, way? so the time story, I think, I can't remember. I guess that was the first interview I did after that just quick New York Times one. So that was the first one where anyone was going to ask me personal questions about my life and I would answer. And I thought, I did think like, okay, they're going to ask me. I'm going to tell the truth. And in fact, like literally the woman who I did love, I mean, she was great. Dolly, Dolly she's wonderful. But mm-hmm. she like sat down. She was like, so how long have you been single? And I was like, I'm not single. And also just FYI. <laughs> and so I told her. And, and that I felt actually perfectly fine about. I felt like I was making that choice. Kelly and I discussed it. I was like, my parents, you know, everyone who needed to know from me in person already knew. So I didn't feel bad about that. But I was happy to tell her and to talk to her honestly about my life. But then the newspaper itself did pulled out of what was a really thoughtful interview with Dolly, who did a lot to contextualize it and talk about it and not make it seem kind of scandalous, then they pulled that just that piece of information and plastered it on there with the headline. And I did feel deeply angry about that and about the sense that, like, that was a feeling. Yeah, it wasn't even just about being outed because I wasn't I wasn't in, I wasn't like, you know, I wasn't keeping it a secret, but the sense that like my sexual and personal life were what mattered about this story. And that impulse that I think traveled along with the story to occasionally just like look away from what I'd written and turn the focus onto me. Mm -hmm. I felt like that was a really clear moment of people just being like, we're going to use 
the we're, I don't know I just felt I've heard the term queer baiting used yeah about that kind of exactly thing. it just felt like this really kind of ugly jab at like ooh isn't it shocking like someone who is dating woman wrote the story about men and it I felt just, like a bit of a gotcha exactly exactly yeah. and, I, and I felt like that was deeply inappropriate so mm. <laughs> if you talk to anyone there you can tell them <laughs> I'm I'll sure tell my know. friends at the UK Times exactly uh, in you know you want this it is about so many things it's about gender, it's about um, dating, it's about sex, it's about relationships. It, the first story that opens the book, uh, Bad Boy, is about a couple who get into this very twisted relationship with a male friend. And what I found so fascinating about that, and God, that story stayed with me, is um, you never say what gender the yeah. couple are. Yeah. I started off thinking that it was two women. Mm-hmm. And then I don't know whether that was just because I was thinking about yeah, you and, uh-huh. and I'm trying to detach the author from the story. And then I thought it was, no, it was a guy and a girl. And then I thought, oh, it could be two guys. Uh-huh. And all the way through to the end, I still don't know. Yeah. Tell me what it was. No. I, well, I can't. Because <laughs> I'm joking. Yeah, but, no. but what I was thinking is having uh, dated men and you're engaged yeah. and being with a woman, are the dynamics different? I mean, <laughs> because that was a unit that felt, felt yeah. universal. Yeah. I mean, I think it's funny. I wrote that story or the first draft of that story years and years ago. And it's the genders have never been specified, but it has been really interesting watching people make different assumptions at different yeah. points. And you do realize, and I think this actually, I think is totally human and normal that people are always imagining an author on the other side of the story and it's shaping the way they interpret the story. And that that is just a piece of the reading experience that will never go away and like shouldn't. And so, this story has also had just this very different and really interesting life as it has traveled along with me and my, yeah, like who I'm dating has changed, but also like the kind of writer that people think that I am has changed. Like I have talked to myself, talked about myself at various times as a horror writer. And when you read this story and you're like, oh, it's a horror story, it's sort of different than when you think, oh, here's Kristen who writes sensitive stories about people dating, you know, and like it's just a different You said context. you felt that when Cat Person – uh, happened that some people would get the wrong idea about the kind of writer you were because horror is very important to you. And when I first heard that there was aspects of horror in this, I was kind of turned off because yeah. I don't like horror. But to me, it's not horror. It's more sort of the Black Mirror type of yeah. horror, that kind of cerebral horror more than gruesome. Right. Yeah. I mean, Could I don't right? think, yeah. And I think there's not a lot of, in some ways, Cat Person's the most graphic story in there. Like there isn't a ton yeah. of like gore and blood. There's very it's little. it's funny, this book is well it's I hope really so. yeah. funny <laughs> I mean I love I think the best horror gets you in this space and maybe horror's the wrong word like maybe people do have a different sort of set of associations than what I mean usually when I say horror but that space of like deep d- like almost pleasurable discomfort like the like, Twilight Zone yeah TV series or Black Mirror or Black Mirror think, or Get yeah. Out if you see yeah, that like that's out. so funny and so it's scary. like a genre it's scary exactly. funny weird right and because that kind Surprising. of laughter where you're like ah yeah. I can't quite believe what's happening. Yeah. That like the, is, the girl, yeah. the woman who likes to bite people. Exactly. <sighs> yeah. Hopefully. Yeah. So that's what I love to read and I love to watch movies that are in that space. And so I like to write it too. And so I think, um, and Cat Person, like for all that it, there are moments I think of like moments where she's laughing and I was laughing writing totally. it, which doesn't at all take away from the fact that it's hugely uncomfortable. I just think that is how it's easy to move back and forth between mm. between those two feelings in a way that can feel really satisfying. And in some ways Cat Person's the most quiet story in this yeah. book because nothing much happens in it, right. which is why I imagine The New Yorker and your agent and you, where everyone was so surprised by the reaction to it because – It's not a big, there's not big drama, there's not big scandal, there's not a massive twist. I mean, the ending is is inspired and brilliant, but there's nothing that's, oh my God. Right. No, the stakes are relatively low. It's a small story. Yeah. And no one dies. Right. And some feelings are hurt Uh and that's pretty much it. And there are some regrets. Right. And I've heard you say that when this thing has become so big, and it's, it is a really unusual thing for everyone to read a piece of fiction at the same time. I mean, yeah. there have been books that have sold so many, right. but they tend to be over like a year. They'll right. be on the New York Times bestseller list for a year because right. the, the vir- virality exactly. of them is so much slower. This, within the space of a few days, maybe a week, everyone read it at the same time right. and the energy of that yeah. was full on. But I've heard you say that it made you feel small yeah. and that's the opposite of what I would have thought. I would have thought that it would have made you feel omnipotent and amazing (laughs) and like some kind of you know yeah Captain Marvel flying (laughs) over the earth 
<laughs> yeah, I don't know. I think, the, and there's certainly there were moments, I don't know if I ever felt like Captain Marvel, but like where I felt like, wow, where I had some distance up from it. I thought, oh, like, I'm really proud that this happened. I feel like I've achieved something. It means a lot to me. You know, if I'm hearing one-on-one with someone for whom the story was meaningful, that feels good and palpable. But I think what is hard, or just what... There's a scale thing that happens, I think, particularly on the internet, where, yeah, for for 48 hours, it it seems like I was a little bit apart from it. But, yeah, everyone was talking about it. Everyone was thinking about it. Everyone had feelings about it. Um, But – and about – me or an idea of me that they had in their head, but that I, that was pretty different from from the reality. And so I think the first piece of it is you see like all of this stuff that's about you that feels like it has nothing to do with you. And then there's this image of like I, I would I would see sometimes and I still this happens where I like read an op ed or there's a TV show, I guess, recently that basically like was about the cat person story. And you just you it's like catching a ver- sight of yourself in a mirror and you just don't recognize it. You know, it, it's it's this feeling of like, oh, my name and my face and this story that I wrote has this other life that I can't control and is happening apart from me. And that can make you just feel kind of like you don't feel like Captain Marvel. You feel like powerless because it's it's doing this thing mm. kind of without you and I think also like the virality of it or that sense that it was like two days where everyone talked about the story it was like both yeah for a minute everyone's talking about you and then like and the, the next, next day whatever happened to Kristen right Rebellion? and I was like literally that was a day ago you know like I remember one point being on Twitter and something like oh I can't believe I have to read this stupid cat person story <laughs> like, you don't have to read it just came out a week ago I'm like, so sick of Christian exactly, Rebellion exactly it's like literally like before I had I even had a chance to understand what's going on we're like oh my god we're so <laughs> tired of talking about this story I'm like god it took me like quite a while to write like we were sick of it in three days and that's like normal but it's just not the pace and scale of it is so it's not a human scale you know it, it's this other thing mm-hmm. and so just when you're just one person kind of seeing it and take, trying to take it in it's just very disorienting and you feel kind of yeah you move from feeling like huge to feeling tiny it's like very hard to have a kind of like right-sized relationship mm. with it well I'm so happy for you I'm so happy for Callie <laughs> and I'm so happy for yeah. everyone that that got to read Cat Person and felt seen yeah I think oh my god we've all been Margot yeah. and also you know you want this is just such a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant book. Oh, thank you. I notice your name is not on the front. Yeah. Why is that? I mean, it, I thought it would be Kristen Rupinian, cat person. You know, you want this. Yeah. <laughs> like and the way publishing works. Totally. And, you know, the book has come out in uh, several different countries. And so it's been really interesting to see the different covers. And w- there is one that's like, my name really large like yeah. a cat tail and then um the, the title small and in some countries um it is called cat person it's not called you know you want this but i love this so this is the the british cover that you guys also have here um and i it's really graphic i love it i feel like it does there are a million different ways to make a good cover i think my covers are good in all the different countries but i do think there's something very kind of I almost want to say masculine about this, like where it's just not about my personality. It's not yeah. about my little face. It's not about, you know, viral sensation. It's 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 a cover that takes the book seriously. And I'm yeah. really grateful for it. And I really love it. So it has a special place in my heart, although they all do in one way or another. The book is just absolutely brilliant. Congratulations. Uh-huh. I can't imagine what you've been through, but I'm so glad you're through the other side yeah, and exactly. in one piece. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to No Filter. If you're after something else to listen to next, can I suggest a great episode of The Quickie? It's our daily news podcast. And we did one on gaslighting that has just gone off. You can follow the link in our show notes to listen or just search what is gaslighting and how is reality TV making it worse in your podcast app. You can buy Kristen's book, You Know You Want This, at any good bookstore. And No Filter is produced by Liza Ratliff. I'm Mia Friedman and I will see you on Mamma Mia.